Good evening. It's great to see each and every one of you here tonight. Everybody, I'm... That just scared me. Um, it's great to see each and every one of you here tonight. I, I'm so thankful for the opportunity that I have to be able to stand before you and to proclaim the gospel, to be able to preach. It's, it's always a treat. i got to tell you, though, Russell is a hard act to follow. Uh, especially after his story. I don't have a story like that to, to open my sermon with, Russell. I don't. Um, but what a great morning we had, and we get to continue our worship this evening unto God. And I don't have a story like Russell's to tell, but I do have a little insight or a little story for you. Some of you asked this morning where Kelsey and the kids were. They left on Friday, and they went to Austin, and they got to spend some time with her parents and do some things, and they're back now. But since they were gone, I had a lot of time uh, to work on this sermon in quiet, and uh, it's seven points. <laughs> so buckle your seatbelts and have your Bibles ready, because we're going, we're going to go a, a little quick. But what I wanted to talk tonight, to talk about tonight, as Russell and I were talking throughout the week about what it was that he was going to preach on, and, and he said unity, and I thought, what principle, what act of worship best magnifies the idea of unity? Preaching? Singing? What? Then I got to thinking, and, and, and we talked about something that was rather important. Prayer. Prayer is where we should truly be unified here and outside of the worship setting. We should be unified in prayer. The Bible has a lot to say about prayer. The Bible, the Bible has a lot to say about prayer, but what's the standard for prayer? How are we to pray? What are we to pray? Do we know how to pray in private and in public? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17 is a verse that we commonly use that talks about praying without ceasing. Well, that sounds great and that sounds wonderful. Pray without ceasing, continually going to God in prayer and petitioning on behalf of ourselves and, our, and our, of our brethren. But, but really, that sounds good and great. But do you know how to pray without ceasing? Do you know how to continually go before the Father's throne? Do you know what it is that you are to say? Did you know that the Bible has a lot to say about what and how we are to approach the Father? Jesus' prayer life serves as an example for you and I. I want to start with that verse in the book of Mark, chapter 1 and verse 35, to talk about prayer because I want you to understand just how important prayer really is. I want you to understand what it is that we are going to talk about this evening because it was probably one of the most important aspects of our Savior's life while He was on this earth. As He was receiving the will of the Father, constantly communicating with Him, letting the full carnality go to the Father's throne in prayer. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, we have there recorded an example for us concerning Jesus. And it says that he got up a great while before the day and went off into a solitary place and prayed. That's found in the book of Mark chapter 1. The book of Mark is the shortest of all the accounts of the gospel. It's the most fast paced. It's what I call the man's gospel. We have short attention span as, as men, so the book of Mark is probably the most action-packed. It goes very quickly. In fact, key words in the book of Mark, straightway, immediately. Those two words stand out throughout the entirety of the book. It's only 16 chapters. But you go from chapter 1 and you get to chapter 4, and at the end of chapter 4, there you have Jesus arriving at the coast of the Gadarenes, where he encounters a man possessed with demons, a wild man among the tombs. And he heals him and he shows that Jesus has power and dominion over the adversary. And then in chapter 5 you continue forward and he heals a woman with a blood issue. He raises someone from the dead. He continues to go throughout this ministry. He does all of these things throughout his ministry. And we see this great book, of, the, the great book of Mark, so filled with the power of Jesus Christ. But it begins with a simple verse that talks about Jesus' attitude about prayer. You see, Jesus knew the work that he had to do. In fact, Jesus knew that he was to be busy on behalf of Jehovah God. But he also knew that he had to take time to communicate with the Father. When was the last time you, play, you prayed in private? That you went into your quiet place and prayed? 
Prayer is important. Prayer is one of the most important acts of worship. In prayer, we make a few certain assumptions. We make a few certain assumptions when we pray. We make the assumption that there is a God. That there is a God. We make the assumption that there is a God, that we need God. We understand that we need God, that God hears our prayer, that God answers prayer, and that God loves each and every one of us. That's what we do when we go to the Father and pray. Prayer is powerful. John 1 and verse, uh, or James 1, I'm sorry, in verse 17 says that, that every good and perfect gift is from above. It's from God. And prayer is powerful not because of the fact that you and I get to pray, but it's powerful because God hears our prayer and answers over and abundantly. You and I must pray. We need to pray. Prayer must be accompanied with the human endeavor. I'm not sure if some of you have seen the movie Facing the Giants. It's a, it's a good movie. It's a football movie. And there's a little parable told in that movie, and it's about prayer. And I thought it very fitting, and I want to share that parable with you. It talks about two farmers. It's not foreign to this congregation. We have plenty of people that have lots of land that were fervently praying for rain. Well, that's not foreign to our parts either. We, we pray for rain quite often. And it says that as they fervently prayed for rain, one of the farmers went and tended to his land to prepare for it. And then the question is asked, which farmer was prepared to receive what he prayed for? Both were praying for the same thing, but one put action to his prayer and prepared for it. What does your prayer life look like? As we talk about this, that, that, this takes us into our very first point. Let me back up before we get into that first point. I want you to know the attitude that we have this evening. In the book of Luke, chapter 11, there, Jesus is approached by, as he is seen praying, and you hear these words uttered by one of his apostles. Lord, teach us to pray. And I want you to know that the attitude that I have this evening and I shared a little bit of this this morning in my devotional over at the nursing home, is to help you, and most importantly help myself, amplify our prayer life. To build up our prayer lives. To be taught how to pray. And as we look at that parable of the two farmers, it goes straight into our first point. Our first point when we pray, I want you to know that we need to pray sincerely. Turn in your Bibles. We're going to be using our Bibles this evening quite a bit. I'm going to let you know up front. Turn in your Bibles to the book of, of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. There in, in, in the scriptures, Jesus teaching on prayer begins with these words. And he talks about the attitude and sincerity of prayer. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have received their reward. When you pray, you pray to God sincerely. Don't pray as the hypocrites. Do not pray in a manner that even Jesus talks about later on. And he says, vain repetition. Notice what's being condemned there. It's not repetition. It's vain repetition. The sincerity of what is being said is called into question. No, notice the attitude that we are told by Jesus himself that we are to have in prayer. He says, you must be sincere. Don't pray as the hypocrites. And if you're not sincere, Jesus says like the hypocrites, you've already received your reward. You've been seen of men that you know how to pray. I want to be sincere when I go unto the Father. I want to be sincere and have the attitude that we just talked about from Luke 11. Lord, teach me to pray. And the very first step that Jesus says to praying is sincerity. But he does not stop at simply, at simply leaving it there at sincerity. He goes on and he shows us even more as we look to this aspect and this idea of prayer we need to know that in sincerity, in prayer, and in communication with God is strictly condemned in Matthew 15. 
God condemns insincerity. Well, why is that? Well, let's just look. When you look to the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 11, there's a phrase that Jesus uses that's somewhat familiar to you and I, but we live it in the present. He says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will be done, we'll touch on a little bit more here in a moment. But thy kingdom come. Well, the kingdom came, the kingdom is here. You and I, the church, we are the kingdom. But have you ever stopped to think about how the kingdom came to be? Because there when Jesus is answering how it is that we are to pray, and he says, thy kingdom come, understanding that the kingdom was coming, the price that was paid for the kingdom was Jesus' life. Jesus shed his blood on that cruel and rugged cross so that you and I could live in the kingdom. More applicable to this lesson, Jesus died upon the cross so that you and I could pray as the kingdom. I want to be sincere in honoring the sacrifice of Christ because it is his life that gives me the opportunity of prayer. Prayer also should not only be sincere, but prayer should be humble. We ought to be humble when we pray. Turn in your Bibles just a little, uh, a little ways over to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 gives us a story about two men that went up to a hill to pray. One was a Pharisee and one was a publican. You know this story, you're familiar with it. But I want to share it with you tonight because it is a key example in how it is that we are to approach the very throne of God in prayer. Beginning at verse 9 of Luke chapter 18, it says, And he spake a parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Notice who he's talking to at this point. He's not talking to his disciples. He's talking to some that he would have probably referred to back in Matthew chapter 6 as those hypocrites that prayed on the street corner and were rightly receiving their reward. They thought unto themselves to be righteous. He says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And there's not really a lot of humility in this prayer, is there? But look at the next prayer. Keep reading. Look at the next prayer. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this, that the men went down to, that both, uh, that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. This is especially true in prayer. Remember, we make some assumptions when we go to God in prayer. And one of them is that God loves us. And the other is that God answers prayer. And the other one is that God hears prayer. And that we need God and that there is a God. And when we understand these things and we go to God, look at how it is we are to go to God. We should go to God with the assumption that we need him and not the other way around the publican not even lifting his eyes unto heaven I wonder if this gives any more more rapport to what Jesus says in the book of Ma in, in Matthew 6 when he talks about going into your closet to pray going into a private place in a solitary place to be found praying Look at the attitude there. There is no one around to see me. There is no one around to criticize. There is no one around to witness or to exalt or to amplify me for my prayer. I'm in a closet. Look at the publican's prayer. Not even so much as lifting his eyes unto heaven. You look at the very presence of God. There was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Moses who wanted very badly to see God. And God tells him, no man can look upon me and live. But Moses wanted it more than anything. But look at the presence of God. Look at the presence that he bears. 
that the eyes of man cannot behold it. Look at the attitude of the prophet. Woe, for I am undone, for my eyes have seen the king. Notice that he did not even see God directly. He saw the train of his garment that filled the temple. And he says, Woe, for I am undone, for I have seen the king. The glory of God and God and who he is and how we approach him in prayer and at his throne should be a place of true humility. Not only, though, are in prayer are we to be sincere and humble, we are also to be watchful. What is it that we are to pray for? Look at the book of Mark, chapter 13 and verse 33. Here, if you have, if you have subcontext in your Bible... It probably breaks 32 through 37 up and it probably has a headline that says something like watch and pray or watchful prayer. In verse 32 he says, But of that day and of that hour no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed. What he says next? Watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. You and I long for a day that we get to be with our Father and the saints in heaven. I long for that day. I hope that you do as well. But as we have time left on this earth, opportunity to continually go to God in prayer and to pray, think about the attitude that you have in going before Him in watchfulness. Watch and pray. Do you pray with the very attitude that he is returning and it could be soon? What a beautiful thought. I often have wondered, as I'm sure many of you have, what it will be like when Jesus returns. If Jesus returns in my lifetime, what will I be doing? Where will I be? And I thought to myself, what beautiful place to be if Jesus returns and I'm in prayer and I'm in prayer and I'm truly living what, what Paul says to the church at Thessalonica praying without ceasing and Jesus returns and I'm, I'm found in prayer what beautiful thought watch and wait we don't know when he's coming back but watchfulness also carries with it the idea of the watchman that you read of in the Old Testament we are to care for one another. We are to look towards one another. We are to care about each other in such a way that we look out for one another. That we have our eyes steadily on our brethren, not in a way to pass judgment or of ill will, but of protection and of exaltation and admonition. Watch. Watch out for one another. For the day is drawing nigh when Jesus does return or we are taken from this life. Remember, the New Testament says life is but a vapor. It's here one minute and it's gone the next. What beautiful thought to know that my brethren care enough about me that they pray for me and that they are watching and waiting and praying with me for the return of Jesus himself. Watchful prayer is just as important as being sincere and humble. But there's another aspect of prayer, and this is the aspect of prayer where we get a little bit more detailed. We get a little bit more inclusive, and we get a little bit more appropriate in our setting. What about public prayer? What about public prayer when men of the congregation come to this very podium and offer a prayer on the behalf of all the saints? It resounds in this congregation with the word Amen, signifying that we are all in agreement. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but do you pay attention to all the words that are prayed from this book? Men that lead prayer, do you pay attention to what, it's, what you are saying when you get behind this book to lead a prayer on behalf of the congregation? Are you prepared or do you do it on a whim? Look at what Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15, it says, What then? 
I will pray with the Spirit. Notice what he says next, though. And I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. Now, singing with understanding, we could, we could go all day on, on that lesson. We heard a great lesson on it uh, just recently. But I want to talk about the part where Paul talks about prayer and praying with understanding. Knowing what it is that you are saying on behalf of the saints. I had a list and I, I forgot, I left it. I, had it wrote, I wrote it on a sticky note of commonly used phrases in prayer. And I, I was thinking of these on my own. But phrases like, guide, guard, and direct us. Or like, bring us back at the next appointed time. You could, you could add to that list for me. These aren't necessarily vain repetitions. They are repetitions. They're ways that we have been taught to pray. But do you understand what those words mean? For instance, guide, guard, and direct us. Do you have a biblical understanding of, guide, of God's guidance? of how God guards His children, of how He directs us. That He guides us. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a, uh, and a light unto my path. That, that guide is the word. He guards us with the word. He has hedged us about. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. He, said, he, he, he even goes on and he talks about being a peculiar people. That peculiar people is exactly what's said even of Job when that when the adversary, when the devil himself says to God, you've hedged him about, you've put a fence around him and protected him. Well, you know how you do that today? With the word of God. Direction. Do you know where it is that we get direction? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. They should be familiar to each and every one of us. But it's that the word of God provides all for us. It provides everything for us. Reproof, rebuke exhortation, long suffering, all of those things. It's profitable for all of those things and it makes the man of God perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. The Word of God does that. All Scripture is inspired of God and it's profitable to do those things. Perfect is the idea of being complete. Guide, guard, and direct us means so much more than just a phrase that we picked up by hearing others lead prayer. It takes understanding, though, to know those things. Bring us back at the next appointed time. Do you know why you want to be back? It's not a trend necessarily here, but it's a trend across the brotherhood. You go to any congregation, pick up a bulletin, the numbers for Bible class, they'll be okay. Sunday morning worship, a very nice number. Sunday evening, a little bit lower of a number. Then you take that Sunday morning worship and you cut it in half and you have your Wednesday number. I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Bring us back at the next appointed time. Amen. When we say amen, we are affirming that we will be back at the next appointed time when someone leaves that prayer? Do we mean it when we are attentive to prayer? Do we have an understanding of what is being said when those men come here to say that prayer? It's rooted in the book of Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. That not forsaking the assembling of the saints, that not forsaking, that means bring us back at the next appointed time. Bring us back at the next appointed time when the saints are gathered together to lift pleasant worship unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we say amen. But do we mean it? The numbers don't show it. Not necessarily here, but across the brotherhood. This is important. Understanding those things that are being said from... This podium or anywhere in a public setting are important, especially if we are going to affirm it with an amen. We must pray with understanding. We must also pray with faith. With faith. I don't stop at just understanding. He says, I pray in the Spirit and I pray with understanding. But what does the Spirit mean? 
Well, understanding in the Spirit is the spiritual aspect, not so much the physical aspect. Let's look to what he means here and understand that we are to pray with faith. Remember, we made some assumptions in my introduction about what we do when we pray. And what we do when we pray is we assume that there is a God, that we need God, that God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Look here at uh, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, and verse, beginning at verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you say unto a mountain, Be thou removed, and thou cast it into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. I want you to notice something, though, because he's talking about something here that, that many have taken in a, in a wrong direction. If you pray to God to be a millionaire, it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to bless you with a million dollars. Okay? We must pray in accordance also, in accordance with God's will. Jesus' example of prayer in the garden is a testament to that. Before Jesus went to the cross, he said, Father, if there is any way, any way that this cup could pass, let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. There is the example of our attitude in prayer. When Jesus says, whatsoever things you shall ask and believe, it shall be answered as long as it is in accordance with God's will. But know and trust that God does answer prayer. Sometimes the answer isn't the answer that we want. But you can rest assured that God answers prayer. Never forget to keep it in accordance with God's will and not the will of man. Finally this evening, I want you to know why it is. Why it is that we must amplify our prayer lives in this fashion. I touched a little bit on it. Touched a little bit on it. But in the book of John, chapter 14, it's probably one of my favorite contexts in the entire book of John. Here in the book of John in chapter 14, Jesus begins by telling his disciples and those closest to him, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go now to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will return and receive you unto myself. What beautiful idea to know that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us in heaven. But as that place has been prepared for us, and as we see in Scripture that Jesus has gone back to His rightful place, seated at the right hand of the Father, we know and we understand that we still have an avenue of communication to Him in preparation for the place that He has prepared for us. Look at what He says here in this context. In, in verse 13, he says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So where does this in Jesus' name come from? Right here in Scripture. Jesus tells us that we are to pray unto the Father in the model prayer. He says, You pray unto the Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We are to pray to the Father, but who are we to pray through? Well, Jesus says it's through His name. The, in the original language, in the original manuscripts, in, in His name literally means by His authority. By His authority. Well, Jesus in the book of Matthew chapter 28 says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Although Jesus sits in heaven and awaits his return, he still has authority and dominion over this earth. And by his authority, you and I go to the Father's throne. Because of his sacrifice, 
because of his sincerity, because of his humility, because of his watchfulness. See, what I didn't tell you is that all of these traits and characteristics that we just looked at from different avenues of Scripture are the very traits that took Jesus to the cross. And because of the traits that took Jesus to the cross, you and I have an opportunity to meet Him in the very throne room of God when we pray. And it's only by His authority and His authority alone that we have that privilege and that blessing. I want you to take tonight and examine your prayer life. Does it look like the prayer life that we've read about here in Scripture? Is your prayer life humble? Sincere? Is it watchful? Is it understood? Is it in accordance with God's will? Is it faithful? Is it fervent? What does your prayer life look like? We have a congregation here of faithful, praying people. And that is why we are afforded an opportunity to do many great things to reach out into this community. Because we do things in accordance with God's will. From the preaching to the teaching, from the singing, from partaking of communion on the first day of the week, we do things in accordance with God's will. And when it comes to prayer... We ought to do that also in accordance with God's will and with the attitude and the traits that God has defined for us in the scriptures. Examine your prayer life tonight. As I also offer unto to you the invitation. The invitation to have the privilege to go to God in prayer. For prayer is a privilege of the Christian. And if you are not a Christian tonight, you don't know the benefits of prayer the way that you could and the way that you should. If we could assist you in your obedience to the gospel and helping you obey it and meeting Jesus in the watery grave of baptism and taking advantage of that sacrifice that he made upon the cross some 2,000 years ago, don't delay. The time is now. Perhaps you may have already obeyed the gospel, but you've fallen short. There's no better and more convenient time to make things right with God than now as we stand and as we sing together.